this will be the last um, video and the last part of the notes uh, going into the um, <clears throat> the first exam. <clears throat> Sorry. So all of the material uh, on the exam will will end at the end of what we're doing on this. It will include uh, the notes, obviously. I hope you're taking nice expanded notes so you can go through and find answers. It uh, will include the um, handouts that uh, have been available in the lab. And if you're working remotely, we, we have made arrangements to get you the handouts. It will include um, the lab material, although the lab materials tend to be bumped to the end of the, of the questions. Everything else is kind of integrated into the sequence of events, the sequence of material that we've uh, done through uh, the course of this part of, uh, of the semester. So uh, I know that on these, you can, uh, the, the words are bigger, but maybe if you can't read it, it says, Calvin, your test was an absolute disgrace. It's obvious you haven't read any of the material. Our first president was not Chef Boyardee, and you ought to be ashamed to have turned in such preposterous answers. And after a moment of reflection, he goes, I just don't test well. So the next section of things that can make you sick, disease causes, is the first of a couple of different groups of, um, of worms. And uh, I have to readjust the, the video occasionally so that it, it doesn't blat out this. I've figured out, I think, how to keep it from blatting out this. but. Um, but if I walk off the screen and come back, I, I apparently have to have to reset it. Sorry about that. But I gotta go over here and write on the overhead. So worminess is is a very common feature in um, the world. There's a whole bunch of, of whole groups that are just different types of worms, but they're different types of worms. And then that wormy shape winds up in things like snakes and eels, um, legless lizards, there, are, there is such a thing. It's, it's, it's a very convenient shape if you're in tight places. If you're burrowing or you're in a body, is it, uh, it can be really, really, really useful. The flatworms, also known as platyhelminthes, which is a very fancy Latin word that translates to flat worms, uh, are just what it sounds like. They were one of the early um, evolutionary steps toward uh, having a whole bunch of cells being multicellular. But you do run into a problem with multicellularity, which is as you get bigger, you have to get oxygen, from around you. You have to get waste materials out, which can be toxic, which means that your cells either need a supply system that provides that stuff, or all of your cells need to be pretty close to a surface where the oxygen comes in and the waste materials go out without a whole bunch of cells in between to scarf up the oxygen or be toxic, uh, exposed to the toxic uh, wastes. These guys are flat that puts even the cells in the very middle of them, close to the top of the bottom. And they, they're remarkably flat, some of them. And uh, there's a few different groups. There's three actually main groups, one of which I'm just gonna mention here because there's one whole group of flatworms that uh, doesn't live in other living things, that are not parasites, they just live out in the world. And they're, they're all, all around us, they, they, they live in the ponds, they're the little bitty brown guys that, that crawl on the, on the bottom. Um, you may look at this and, and go, from what he's describing, are leeches flatworms? No, leeches are a totally different thing. And leeches are, um, are way too thick. Yeah, they're flat, but their center cells would be way too far from the surface for that to be a useful situation. Leeches have circulation systems to move the oxygen and the waste around. Anyway, these guys tend to be fairly small, when they are big, they still are very, very flat. There's some, uh, in the group of things that live out in the environment, there are some ocean flatworms. They get, you know, decent size, but flat as a piece of paper. Uh, 
So I'm going to talk about uh, those in passing, but they're not going to wind up here. Just the two main uh, parasite groups of the flatworms. What's called the trematodes. Um, that should have an S on it. The flukes. Um, that's a common name. Uh, in English, it also is um, used for things that are flat. Um, the, the end of a paddle is called a fluke. The, uh, the, the things that stick out the side of a whale tail are called flukes. And uh, these guys are shaped kind of that way. They're shaped kind of like a paddle. Uh, or like the end of a paddle without the, without the handle. Um, Remember media, intermediate hosts? These guys go through alternation of generations, uh, something I mentioned when I was talking about malaria. They have a sexual stage and an asexual stage. The asexual stage for flukes almost always happens in some snail species. And uh, the fluke species can be very, very particular in what snails they will live and reproduce in. That has turned out to be very useful for us because even though we could transport a lot of parasites from the old world to the new world, very rarely has a fluke been brought to the new world that could find a compatible snail to do its first stage in, which means it can't do its second stage where it comes back into uh, the original host, in this case, people, or the animals that we bring as well. So flukes don't tend to be a huge problem um, here in North America. There are a couple. I'll mention one, uh, but they are major issues um, elsewhere in the world, including uh, what I'm going to mention here. Well, before I do that, uh, the fluke that we have um, to look at in the, uh, in the lab, we've got a couple of uh, flukes in, in the lab, um, but one of them is, is called the Chinese liver fluke. And it may, it's a good example fluke. Um, it reproduces in a freshwater snail asexually. So produce a whole bunch of larvae that uh, then come out of the snail and get picked up by some small animal because these things are small. To get to humans, which is the definitive host where they're gonna do their sexual reproduction, they actually have to work their way up the food chain. So something bigger eats the thing that ate them and then something bigger eats them and they work their way up to fish that people would catch and eat. And that's what happens. People catch the fish. They eat the fish. This is a, a, um, a fluke of areas of the world where a lot of food is prepared, uh, marinated but not cooked. Sushi, that sort of thing. And uh, if you cooked it, you'd kill the worms. But there are areas of the world where the, there's not a lot of cooking fuel. And so a tremendous amount of food has been developed that doesn't need to be cooked. This is a problem with that. Um, and if, you, if you're somebody who eats sushi, you always wanna ask, is the sushi imported? If it comes from East Asia, maybe you should be not eating that sushi. They're, they're pretty good at not transporting contaminated fish, but, um, but when we do get cases of Chinese liver flukes in the United States, it's either people that have traveled, picked them up and come back. Some people have carried them for decades if they only have one or two. It's not worth the risk of treating for them. Um, and some people have gotten them from imported sushi. It is, it is a rare occurrence, but why, why take the chance? Is that you can use North American fish to make sushi and then it's not a big deal. Uh, so they work their way at the food chain. You eat the fish, the, uh, you digest around the, the, the worm larvae, which again, resists your digestion, but uh, they, they emerge from the fish meat and, uh, and crawl their way up into your liver. And then they, they eat your liver cells. They, they consume your liver cells. They're, they're little bitty worms. So like I said, if uh, there are people who went to the Korean War and came back with like one or two of these and uh, were offered the option of, well, we can treat you for these, but the treatment's pretty dangerous. You know, it, it, we have to hit a certain level of toxin that'll kill the worms and not kill you. And then people go, well, I guess I'm naming them then. 
And you can live indefinitely with just a couple of these things unless you develop an allergy to them. Because they don't, as my mother used to say when uh, we were on a picnic and a fly landed on the food and we go, mom, there's a fly on the food. She go, well, well, they don't eat much. And the same thing's true with the Chinese liver food. But they produce eggs. The eggs go down your tubes that connect your liver to your digestive system. You pass the eggs. Uh, the eggs wind up in uh, water because these are uh, the snails that they use live in water, obviously. And, uh, and then the cycle is started again. Uh, and there's a number of liver flukes that, that do that, including there's a decent number of liver flukes in animals in North America that have been here kind of forever. They didn't need to be transported in. Um, there is a very, very dangerous fluke that the World Health Organization, which is, um, let me set my glasses down. It's a health organization, but it is because it's a collection of, from a whole bunch of different countries. It's also somewhat political. And it's gotten le lately during the pandemic in some trouble for that because it's trying to keep a whole bunch of very, very different countries happy. So there's some things that they probably should push that they don't push because uh, they don't want to push back against it. Uh, but one of the things they do is that they develop um, like a, a hit list. I, it's got an official name, but everybody calls it the hit list of the top 10 disease organisms that they think should really be a focus of, of research and elimination. In the 1980s, out of nowhere, this virus showed up, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and uh, very quickly um, worked its way up the list to number one. When they're trying to decide who goes on the list, it's a combination of um, the, the number of people that um, either are infected or potentially could be infected, um, the, the, the danger of the disease, you know, how deadly is it, and certain amount of political, like economic impact. And so HIV moved up to the top of the list. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about was number one on the list before HIV knocked it down. And it's still pretty up there. I don't know exactly where it is right now. But this is an example of a type of fluke. Schistosomes. This one doesn't go through a whole bunch of, of what they call vector hosts to get from the snail to the human. Schistosomes, the larvae, which are little swimmy guys, um, emerge from the snail and swim around uh, bumping into things and trying to bump into human skin. Uh, so it's a really major part, uh, problem in places in the world where they grow rice because you have people in the rice paddies and so there's a lot of access. Um, European colonialism has actually spread schistosomes because they went from areas where, which, where farming was, was the local, local family farm and they used drip irrigation where you'd run water through tubes and just kind of drip it into the soil to keep your plants going um, to kind of mass farm approaches which require irrigation ditches running from a source of water you know, through the farms and of course Irrigation ditch had open water in them, so people who were slogging through the irrigation ditch wind up getting exposed to these as well. Um, so these guys, they get into you through your skin, they migrate up into the connective tissue around the outside of your intestine, and they settle there. And they start to produce eggs. Now they're not in your intestine, they're in the connective tissue next to your intestine. And now we get into the issue with worms, which is they're too big to fight. Is your immune system is cellular. You, you have antibodies, which are molecules, and you have white blood cells, which are cells. And when the parasites get above a certain size, your immune system can't really do anything about them. It can inflame the area around them. It can try to cook them with, with fever. But uh, in situations where neither of those work, your body just kind of settles in and deals with, uh, with, with the damage. But because they don't live in the intestine itself, it's a little tricky to get their eggs out of the body from where they are next to the lining. 
what comes out of the worms are eggs with, with a real pointy spine on them. And they build up in that connective tissue. There's only one layer of uh, epithelial cells between the connective tissue and the, the space of the intestine. And as they kind of move along, they tear through the epithelial lining and that puts them into the space of the intestines and they pass in human wastes into water, the worm's hope, where the eggs will hatch and the, the first stage larva will find a snail to invade. And then the cycle starts over. But the problem is, these are pretty small eggs. They don't all go out. They often get picked up by the drainage system, your fluid drainage system, which eventually puts stuff into your blood. And they can rip up the drainage system. And once they're in your blood, they tumble in all sorts of, of networks of blood vessels and cause all sorts of damage all over the body. It's a major, schistosomiasis is a major, major, major dangerous disease. So, uh, but it's, there's two different types, but they're spread from uh, Central Africa all the way to the east side of Asia. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a major issue. Now we're lucky. We don't have the right snails. That's the only reason probably that we don't have schistosomes or at least that we didn't in the past. Uh, here's a scary thing though. In 1909, there was an outbreak of schistosomiasis in North Carolina. And it wasn't just in people that carried it back from somewhere. It was in locals, which means that in that part of North Carolina, the schistosomes found a snail that they could use. Nobody knew about schistosomiasis or how it worked at the time. It just kind of, there was an outbreak and then it kind of disappeared. Possibly because there weren't enough snails and the, schist the first wave of schistosomes may have wiped out the snails or made them so rare that the schistosomes couldn't sustain a population. But that's how lucky we are, that, that, that those were not widespread, very common snails or schistosomiasis might have spread through North America. There are schistosomes here, and they do have lots of snails that they, they are happy with, but they're not human infecting schistosomes. Trying to make an S here. There's a schistosome of water birds, of geese and loons and that sort of thing. And they're worms. They don't have much in the way of a brain. If they bump into what feels like the right kind of skin, they will enter the skin and wander around. And any place where this is common, it'll emerge in the water at certain times of year. And if you're in the water as a human, it'll try to use you. It'll get into you. Now, it can't live in you very long. It can't really distribute itself the way that it wants to. But your immune system will be very unhappy with these things wandering. And it tends to produce at least an itch, sometimes an irritation. If they get into your eye, it can be bad. But around here, we have this occasionally. When I first moved into the area, um, when there used to be a public beach up at uh, Caroga Lake, um, there was a whole month of the summer where they closed the beach due to swimmer's itch where there, there were enough of these things in the water that they just didn't let people in, swim in the water, at least not at the public beach. Um, but they can't do the dangerous stuff in us because we're not compatible, definitive, final hosts. But apparently they got, they're fine with the snails that we have locally, and there's plenty of snails to keep the population going. As I said, there's, there's a number of different flukes that live in people. I've just talked about a couple of them. Um, because of the snail thing, it's not a common North American problem, or even a South American problem. It's mostly Europe and Asia and, and Africa, where people have been for a very, very long time, and so, and the parasites are well adapted to what's available in the ecosystem. The next type of flatworm everybody's heard of tapeworms. These are <clears throat> long, flat, and white. They look like tape. And what you have is um, in the adult tapeworms, they have a little head on them that they call a scolex that has things that it uses. It lives in your intestine. 
and on its scolex, it has structures that help it to stay in one place. Uh, sometimes it has suckers, sometimes it has little shallow hooks. It often, your, your intestines have a lot of bumps and, and uh, folds and stuff. It'll, you know, push its scolex into one of the folds and then kind of hang on with the hooks and the suckers. And behind the scolex, it produces a series of segments. So it's making them here. So the longer the worm is, the farther back this is, the older it is. These are the new ones, these are the old ones. And they can get long. Um, in a human, it's not unusual for tapeworm to be six, seven feet long, because that's about the length of your small intestine. The segments are little reproduction packets. That's really all they do. As they get older, they develop male parts and female parts. Um, a, your typical tapeworm, it, it's got some muscles in it. Is if uh, you have a tapeworm that's all by itself, it can kind of curl around and the male part of one segment can reproduce with the female part of the other segment. And they can mix and match their genes, mix their genes up that way and produce you know, offspring that are genetically different from they, that they are. Um, usually the adults, don't cause much in the way of disease. So, now some people, their system does respond to them. <clears throat> And in some people, um, these guys produce some metabolic molecules that are, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that we don't have. And some people will develop allergies to them and those allergies can get dangerous, but that's a rare side effect. Um, these guys, a lot of the, the long ones can control their own population. Once you get a few of them, now they're very thin, so they don't take up a lot of room, but there's not a huge amount of room in an intestine. And you get a few of them and a new larva comes in, they will, a new egg comes in. Um, they will uh, keep it from developing into an adult. They'll control their own population, right? Sexually reproducing, you don't need a lot of offspring in order to, to, to hope for variety. There's a lot of variety being generated. So, uh, and they do their asexual reproduction in another host. That's can be the issue. Unlike flukes that always use snails or some relative of snails, um, there's a whole bunch of different types of tapeworms that use a whole bunch of different types of intermediate hosts. We can be intermediate hosts for a variety of different tapeworms, in which case um, you pick the eggs up somehow. Uh, sometimes you can pick them up from, from uh, eating larvae that's embedded in meat. There's a pork tapeworm that you can pick up that way. Um, there's a dog tapeworm that fortunately is very, uh, very, very, very rare in the United States, um, where it, uh, the eggs pass with the, the dog wastes, but they last in the environment for a good long time. So long after the wastes have dried up and kind of just become part of this, the, uh, the dirt, you can pick the eggs up just getting your fingers in the dirt. And if you swallow them, the larvae will hatch out of the eggs. They will, the larvae will move out of your intestine and it find some spot in your body to settle and they will grow into what's called generally a bladder worm. Now this dog tapeworm is rare in that it produces a very, very small tapeworm, only has three segments to it. And because it's very small, it can populate an intestine with lots and lots of offspring. And the bladder worm will potentially get big enough to be, itself be a whole bunch of offspring. So it grows. They call it a bladder because it's round, it's got fluid inside, and actually around the outside, sticking to the inside are a whole bunch of inside-out tapeworm heads. If, you, if, the, if a dog eats uh, meat with the bladder worms in it, uh, the, the tapeworm heads go right side out and they attach and they separate and 
suddenly the dog went from having no tapeworms to having a whole bunch of tapeworms, little bitty tapeworms. In us, the bladders will get as big as they can depending on where they have settled. So if they're embedded in a muscle, they're not gonna get huge. If they're embedded in an intestine, uh, I know of someone in India who had one the size of a basketball. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> you can remove them, but again, if they're full of tapeworm fluid and people generally build up an allergy to it, as long as it's confined in the bladder, it's okay. But if you're trying to take it out and you accidentally cut it and the fluid comes out, people have died from an allergic reaction to that. So they, they have to expose it, suck all the fluid out, replace the fluid with uh, a, another solution, and then they have to take it out. <clears throat> there are weird things like, I can't explain why this happens. I don't know that anybody can. Right now in your bones, you have cells in there that are breaking your bone down. <clears throat> and then cells that make the bone back where it used to be. So you're breaking down, renewing it, breaking down, renewing it. Sometimes people get one of these worm larvae in their bone, and as soon as they've broken a bit of bone down, the worm larvae expand into the space. So inside a solid bone, they can get bigger and bigger and bigger until you like wave goodbye to somebody and your arm just snaps because it really was a very thin layer of bone around a hollow bladder worm. So these, as if you're the intermediate host, different types of tapeworms can be fairly dangerous. As the final host with the adults in your intestine, they don't tend to be that big a deal. But there are a lot of, uh, of, of different varieties of tapeworms. <clears throat> okay, as I said, that's where the cutoff is gonna be for the exam. Um, and for the, the, the second exam, we'll start up with the next section, which is roundworms.